to me, sometimes the guides show it to me as like, there are tons and tons of contingency plans. Like if you don't do your, your mission or your path or you do this instead, that's totally fine, but you're gonna fulfill some sort of role anyway. They were not required at all to do what we came here to do. We can do anything. And anything that you do is, is accurate and correct. No matter what though, you'll always do what you're supposed to be doing. Like there is a goal here and there is like a preferred, like, well, if you did this, you would really learn your lessons and maybe you wouldn't have to come back here as often, but you can do whatever you want <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> we really do have free will always. Hello, sweet friends. Welcome back to Unbroken Chain. I am Mara James, and that is Ty Finellis. Ty and I got to hang out in Atlanta a little earlier this summer, and Ty is an intuitive. She's a channeler, and as you'll hear in this conversation, that was something that very much found her, and that in fact she had resistance to for a period of time before really stepping into it. And I have to say, I feel so much gratitude for people like Ty who have stepped into those gifts and have carried that wisdom because that is so goddamn courageous in the face of dominator culture that is so oppressive and disconnected and can tell really fearful, divisive stories about people who are connected to sources of wisdom beyond the plane that we have all agreed in our mass hallucination is reality. I'm really grateful in my life that working with plant medicines has opened me up to plant consciousness, plant spirit, and through that even to mineral spirit. I, I remember sitting in the jungle once years ago and realizing, oh my gosh, everything around me, every single thing I can perceive has spirit, consciousness, intention, and if I choose to, I can connect my consciousness to it and learn from it and be taught by it. And after talking to Ty, I definitely clocked in myself a bit of a, a bit of an urgency, a, a desire to be able to see my guides, to be able to, to, to see as she can, the spirits that I certainly sense are backing me up in this life. You know, my, my team that I, I absolutely feel is present with me as I move through the world. And it took me a couple of weeks of kind of sitting with that feeling to realize that that is a space that I think Ty and many others throughout time are holding. And in fact, it is my job to listen and ask for the ways that those guides want to come through to me because in wanting to see them in that particular way, I think I'm missing out on the ways that they're already talking to me. And Ty does such a beautiful job, I think, inviting all of us into connection with some really concrete, practical tools. So I, I think this is a really comforting, reassuring, and inspiring conversation to anybody that is experiencing forms of communication with other realms of consciousness and isn't quite sure how to hold that. I have a friend who is in communication with extraterrestrials and has really wrestled with that for years because it's felt so not okay within her own self, but especially to share with the world. And I, I understand, I mean, this is the kind of thing that I did not have space for for many years, was extremely judgmental about until plant medicines, like I said, opened me up to the rich, wild beauty of possibility in this incarnation. And it's made my life better. And I, I can see that it, it makes other people's lives better to realize that we're not alone in this thing, that reality is not this narrow bandwidth that we see through the filter of our human perceptions. And in fact, is a vast infinite wealth of wisdom that we can tap into. And and there have been people like Ty throughout time. I love how she talks about different cultures and the containers with which they hold and understand spirits and animals and the animism of the sensuous world around us, as David Abram calls it. And um, 
gosh, it, it makes life more worth living, more, more worth experiencing to me. And, um, I am, I'm so grateful to feel kinship from, from people like Ty in that and from many, particularly women and those who have identified as women throughout time who have really courageously held space for intuitive wisdom in the face of rational worshiping culture for thousands of years. So, I invite you to join this conversation with an open heart and mind to think about the places in yourself where you have room to open more portals to connection with the wisdom that flows through all of us and that we may have been taught in various ways to ignore or close down because it doesn't make sense or feels crazy it's not crazy, you're not crazy, and you're also so not alone. There is a huge team of, of spirits that want you to succeed in your particular life mission here and, and who want the human species to succeed no matter how hard we seem to be trying to, to sabotage ourselves. There is plenty of wisdom to be accessed and there are ways that you in your life right now can access it if you wish to widen those channels. Ty made me feel so calm and reassured. She's a beautiful young woman which is one of my favorite incarnations of magical healing power and uh, I learned a lot from her and um, I know you will too. So come hang out with us very sweaty day in Atlanta. Here we are. How I got started with this was kind of a long story, um, but it started a couple years ago where my grandmother passed away and I wasn't too close with her at the time. I was living in Georgia. She was in New York. Um, she passed and a few days after I learned that she passed away, she walked into my bedroom in Georgia and she was like, hi, <laughs> I'm here and I'm okay. I'm doing fine. Wow. And I freak out and I, I wake up and I'm kind of like, oh my God, what's going on? You're supposed to be dead. Grandma, what's happening? But she calms me down and she tells me that she's okay and that she's fine. And she just wants me to tell my mom that she's okay. And then she tries to tell me to go back to sleep. Somehow I end up going back to sleep, but I wake up the next morning and I'm kind of like, that was really odd. It was a strange dream and I dismiss it as a dream. But since that night, I kept having dreams where beings and different humans that I, I never met in my life would come and teach me things about mm -hmm. spirituality and humans that I didn't know and how to read people, stuff that I was really, I was really against at that time in my life. I grew up Catholic, but I was an mm -hmm. atheist. I didn't believe in most of it, and yet I had these dreams where these beings would teach me things about chakras and their auras, and you can read them. And even in the dreams, I would debate against these beings, but um, I started to practice what they what they showed me, and I found out that the stuff I was saying was accurate. Mm. Um, and that was is, that's kind of how I started. <laughs> it's a very odd story, but that's just wow. a little bit. <laughs> Do you think there's a reason why at that time of your life? this was sort of unlocked? It could be because at that time in my life, I had just graduated college. I finished early and I was working a nine to five job. I wasn't necessarily happy at that job, but I was, I accepted it. You know, it was, it was just what I was doing. Mm. Um, I didn't feel like I knew the next step in my life. I just thought I'd work that job until I found another one. Mm. So maybe it, it did come at a time when I needed something to really believe in and put my heart into and my soul into and something to be passionate mm. about because um, I was having trouble finding something I was passionate about at that time. Mm. But this was kind of left field, <laughs> you know, um, five years ago, if you told me this is what I would be doing for a living, I wouldn't have, I would yeah. have ever believed you. <laughs> yeah. So let's just talk about what it means to be a channel. Yeah. So a lot of people have their misconceptions about it in which they think psychics and intuitives and channels sit with a crystal ball and mm -hmm. they have seances and that kind of thing, but that's not really what I do. 
When I channel, I channel beings that are what I call your spirit guides. Um, I can see them and I can also look at your aura and see where you're at. And these beings tell me what's going on with the person. Um, so it's it's just helpful information that can guide a person if they need it, you know, to the next step in their life or to help explain some things that have happened in the past. Um, maybe explain where you're at right now mm-hmm. and what your purpose is in this lifetime. So that's kind of... Um, what my channeling is like. And sometimes it can get very odd when I'm out and about and I see a guide, you know, just kind of walking amongst humans and that kind of thing. Um, But yeah, channeling can be a very powerful tool to help bring um, a person to to the next step, if that helps, or help give some clarity and focus into what's Mm -hmm. going on with your life. Mm -hmm. So you could be in the grocery store and you're seeing multiple planes of reality. Yeah. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it took a long time to get used to that. A very, very long time. Um, and I'm not constantly reading people because that's invasive, huh. but I am, it's one of those things I need to try not to pay attention to if I'm just living my normal life. Only if I see something and it's like with people that I know closely and it's, you know, it's okay for me to share this information, then I, then I go ahead and do so. But yeah, it's very odd. And the way it looks, this is kind of hard to describe, but the way it looks when I see a being, it's not physical. Like it doesn't look mm. like, you know, like you sitting across from me. It's not something I can touch. It almost looks like there's a veil, like a shimmery veil. And there's a being kind of... Um, made out of this this energy, this, this mm-hmm. shimmer. And that's what it looks like. Um, I can see their faces clearly in my mind, but physically it's a little different. So it's not as, as, as if I'm seeing um, like a full on human mm-hmm. or ghost or whatever, although that has happened. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a little different. Was that scary when that started? Yeah, it started slow and I kept having dreams where these teachers would tell me, this is what you're gonna start seeing next. I didn't believe it (laughs) until I started seeing it. But yeah, it started off very slowly where I was just able to see the auras of these beings, just like I'm able to see auras of humans, but the auras are attached to a person. Hmm. Um, I started just being able to see like auras of beings that would walk into the room. And then after that, it just kind of transformed into being able to see this otherworldly person behind the veil, if that makes mm-hmm. sense at all. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it, it really, it still surprises me sometimes. It still scares me. I'm still not used to it. I can never say that I'll be used to it. Wow. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm learning not to react as, as I did in the past, I guess. <laughs> uh-huh. That's so interesting that they chose you for this conduit and kind of had to, it sounds like, convince you that you were the person for the job yeah. almost. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, it's given me another perspective, though, because I understand and I was coming from a background of not believing in anything. Mm-hmm. I just kind of thought that we are the ones that form our futures and are, you know, we make decisions and that's it and there's no higher power. But it's helped me relate to people when I have mm-hmm. clients that are a little bit skeptical and, you know, like I was. And I encourage people to be skeptical, too, because you have to. So it's, it's helped me relate to people on that level, at least, of coming at it from a grounded perspective, mm-hmm. maybe, mm-hmm. I hope. <laughs> so what is your understanding of our universe now? That's, a, that's an interesting <laughs> question. Um, and this is just my, my opinion. It's not what I believe everyone should, should mm. think. But I believe that there, there are larger forces, maybe a higher power, I don't think it's as simple as what we ascribe it to. Like, it's not one person, it's not a man in the sky, maybe Mm -hmm. not. But I think that there is some order to the universe and some order within this chaos. And what I find is that these guides are helping people um, go about their path and do what they're supposed to do. But even if you're not listening to your guides constantly, you're still going to end up doing what you're supposed to do. Um, even if it's you know traditionally good or bad or whatever, all of us are fulfilling our roles no matter what. And all of it is really centered on human evolution and trying to get us to change this world and form this world and learn more about ourselves in a way that hopefully is geared towards a more compassionate side. But when it's not, that's so that we can learn about ourselves and um, 
kind of, this is a hard question, I think, to answer. I'm still figuring it out, as you can tell. (laughs) Um, I believe that we are put here for a purpose, each and every one of us. And no matter what, we'll do the roles and the jobs that we're supposed to do. And we meet certain people in our lives for a reason. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the ulterior goal is or the motive is, you know, whoever is in charge, whatever Mm -hmm. this higher power is. But at the very least, I think it is to understand ourselves Mm -hmm. and to treat every experience that we have as a lesson, Mm -hmm. every single experience and every single person we meet. Mm. I mean, that's beautiful. It's very concrete. Thanks. (laughs) So are the guides, as you understand them, is it like you have a guide or guides and I have my guides, or is there sort of a family of spirits that are accessible to all of us? It's both. Uh Um, Most of us at any given time, at least what I've found and experienced, is that we have maybe 15 to 20 guides kind of circulating around. Um, It could be your ancestors. Mm -hmm. It could be archangels this is where it gets a little a little out there it could be archangels it could be animal animal beings animal spirits it could even be extraterrestrials or aliens Mm -hmm. these are the people that we have that are able to help us and it could be that they're helping us because we've incarnated in other Mm -hmm. lifetimes and we've helped these people or we just have some sort of connection to these other people and they're here at this point to help you so yeah it's um It's different for everyone. The archangels, I find, there's a core group of archangels that most people are connected to, and they help humans, um, and they help individuals as well. So a lot of people have like Archangel Michael as a guy, and Archangel Gabriel, or um, Archangel Raphael, and that gives me information connected to a person's life path. So if you have Archangel Michael as a guide, that means that your life path is most likely connected to strength and courage and building people up, but that also means that you'll go through a lot of lessons Um, related to that before you start to help others Mm -hmm. so yeah it's it's very interesting everyone has different guides for sure but the archangels they rotate around and I I find that they come into sessions a lot (laughs) would you be able to unpack the idea of archangels a little bit sure um and this is again my understanding but the archangels They're beings that have been here since the beginning of time from the research I've done and what they've told me in my dreams. They each have a different goal and a different Mm -hmm. thing that they're interested in evolving within humans. Who are they? I'm not really sure. I mean, they really could just be higher dimensional aliens, you know? Um, When I see them in my dreams, they don't look human and they look like gods and goddesses, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. They don't really describe who they are to me. They just go into what needs the work that needs to be done. So I'm not sure what their stake in this is. Uh I'm trying to read different theories about it, but they just, they're, they're very um, serious and very focused on what human beings need to do to get us to our next step of evolution especially Michael at this point, at this moment in time. Um, He's extremely involved in what's going on and uh, appearing to people in dreams and giving them advice and guidance. But as far as like who they are, I genuinely believe that they are higher dimensional beings that care a lot about Mm -hmm. humanity Mm -hmm. and that want to help. That's reassuring. (laughs) Do you think when we're not in human form that our souls are hanging out with these spirits? Yeah. I've had several dreams where the guides have walked me through the afterlife. They've shown me that when we pass away, we go through this kind of little safe period where we go to a home that like we've created in the afterlife and we stay there for a little while, we calm down, we heal, and then our guides come and collect us and they bring us to this place where they show us what happened in our life, kind of like a life review. Hmm. And they'll show you it once, and then they'll show you another life review from other people's perspective. Every single person that has interacted with you and what their perspective, what their thoughts were when they were interacting with you. Hmm. And it's to help you learn. For most of us, we'll go through this life review and then we'll have some time, you know, and then we decide with our guides what our next life will be like and what lessons we're going to learn, what things we're going to resolve that we didn't in our past life. Other people have different projects. Some people I've noticed have now incarnated here to help 
earth and what, what we're going through right now, which is a very important time. Um, so some people may not, when they pass away, they might not reincarnate again, or they might go off and do something else. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so far, that's what they've shown me. And astral projection is something that they've also helped me do. It's not my favorite way of, of communicating with the guides because it is very scary when you're starting out. Mm-hmm. Um, but just doing astral projection was the first thing. The first time I did it, which happened by accident, the first time I did it, it did prove to me at that point this is real. Mm-hmm. And yes, my soul does exist outside of my body and it's extremely possible. And I'm still myself outside of my body. And it was it was a very impactful experience. So I, I hope that what they show me is is true it Mm. feels true Mm. so astral projecting is allowing your soul to separate from your physical body yes yeah and is there um are there sort of steps that you can take to learn how to do that yeah it's a really cool skill to to have but you do have to have a bit of I guess control with Mm. it which is the hardest part but yeah one of the first steps to astral projection when you fall asleep at night, setting that intention, you can just say it in your head, I like to astral project, or you can say it out loud, and you can ask your guides to help you with that, that you can fall asleep, you can set that intention, and then the guides are, they're saying that it helps to, sorry, they're kind of, they're coming in, um, they're saying that it helps to set a specific goal for yourself, maybe if you want to learn about a past life, or you want to meet one of your guides, um, that's something that you can say and can keep that in your mind as you're falling asleep. This is my goal. This is what I want to do. I want to astral project and meet a guide. And then just keep doing it. Keep saying that to yourself. And then you'll find that some progress will be made. Maybe you'll kind of wake up and you find yourself already lifting out of your, mm. out of your body. And it's scary. It, it will always be scary. But the more you try the better you're going to get at it. And then it'll be that you're um, astral projecting and you're able to go to different places. Like you can mm. say, I want to go to Egypt and walk around Egypt. Mm. <laughs> but yeah, there's astral projection and then there's lucid dreaming, which was the type of dreams that I was having after my grandmother came to me. Lucid dreaming, I, I prefer that method because it's a little less freaky than <laughs> astral projection. But when you want to practice lucid dreaming, it's basically the same thing trying to keep lucid dreaming in your mind, you know, maybe read some books about it, make sure that you're thinking about it when you're awake, Mm -hmm. and then setting an intention for when you go to sleep at night, I want to learn about this, and I want to be awake. Lucid dreaming can really open the doors to so many things about yourself, so many revelations about the world, your future, what's going on um, internally and externally as well, Mm -hmm. and it's a really, really powerful tool, and it's helped me a lot on my journey of accepting all of this. Mm -hmm. I assume most of the fear in those situations would be the feeling of like, will I come back to this body? Is there a potential to be disconnected indefinitely? No. And that was a fear that I had too. When it first started happening, I was like, oh my God, how do I get back in? (laughs) Um, You'll always go back in. I think some people talk about there's like a cord connecting you to your body. So when you astral project or a lucid dream or anything, there's always this etheric cord that connects Mm -hmm. you to your physical body. So you're always, you'll always make it back. Mm -hmm. And there's no, there's no way that you can get lost. Time feels differently when you're over Mm -hmm. there. No matter how long it might seem, you'll always come back. And that's something reassuring that you can say to yourself that you're not going to get lost. And also if you call in your guides to help or just someone to be there to help you, so you're not like alone out there, Mm -hmm. that'll help too. Hmm. So do you use these tools to work on specific problems or questions in your life or the life of somebody that you're working with? Yes. Um. Yeah. I actually find that for a little while I took naps, like in the middle of the day, just like 30 minute naps to see what the difference is between like when I'm sleeping and if I'm napping. I actually found that it was easier for me to lucid dream or astral project if I take a nap in the middle of the day for just 30 minutes or 45 minutes. Um, But yes, I definitely use the dreams to help me with my own personal problems. I encourage and teach clients um, how to use those tools to help them with what's going on, how to connect deeper to their spirituality and what their purpose is here. There's just a lot of value in it. I can't talk Mm. about it enough. (laughs) That was the the reason I was really excited to talk to you because I feel like you put out this vibe very much that 
yes, this is something that you're called to do and comfortable now doing, but you also invite people into their own intuition. Yes. And that's so generous and empowering. And where, where does that start for someone that maybe wants to step into this, but doesn't have yet sort of a concrete direct experience with it? Yeah, that's something I'm extremely passionate about, teaching people how to tap into their intuitive gifts and skills, because it's done so much for me. Mm. But I think that that's how it should be. Mm. Um, everyone should be able to access their intuitive abilities and their intuitive skills, because it's just the ultimate guide to yourself, you know, um, like a map, like someone's giving you a map, like this is how you can figure out what's going on here, or what's happened. For someone who hasn't had direct contact with it, it does take a lot of trust and a lot of believing in yourself. And I like to tell people to treat it like an experiment in the beginning, like what's the harm, you know, try to meditate and, and do these exercises and you know, pretend, just pretend that it might be real, because I, I needed that <laughs> when I started it. But it's, it, I would recommend to start slowly. Um, when I train people, we start off with daily meditations. And mm -hmm. in these meditations, the goal is just to help you connect to yourself first. Mm -hmm. It is extremely important to learn how to have that relationship with yourself before you start getting deeper and deeper into this weird spiritual world. Mm -hmm. So meditation's important. And then doing little exercises, little things that you can do to start noticing things within your world. So it's it's no longer being invisible to what's going on around you, but it's you being hyper aware of what's going on with other people, mm -hmm. what's going on in your environment, you know, just kind of looking at everything as if it's there for a reason. Even if it's just maybe papers or books strewn around your desk, all of that is there for a reason. So trying to look at the world in a different way. And then after that, um, trying to find some intuitive meaning behind these random events. It's kind of starting small and then going uh, further into communicating with your guides and that kind of thing. But again, it takes a lot of trust in something that you're not able to prove or other people may not understand. Mm -hmm. But I almost feel like the more that you keep working on it, the more that you keep viewing everything as if it happens for a reason, the easier it will be to do things like, you know, ask questions before you fall asleep at night and see what mm -hmm. happens. Or if you start seeing things in your dreams uh, and also paying attention to your dreams, that's huge. Hmm. Um, for There's lots of people that don't even remember their dreams anymore, but even just setting an intention or keeping in, dreams in mind will start to kind of trigger your higher self and your guides mm. to be like, oh, they're paying attention now. We'll send them some information and see what happens. So that's another easy way to kind of like ease into this world. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Would you feel comfortable talking about your guides and sort of the ones that are with you maybe right now in this conversation <laughs> and yeah. how, how they communicate with you and how you sort of differentiate that from your personal voice? Yes. I'm very lucky that I'm clairvoyant so that I can I can see them. In the beginning, a lot of people that are clairvoyant um, have something that's called claircognizant, which is clear knowing, where they just know you just know things and you're kind of like, is it me? I'm making it up. I'm being dramatic. I'm, you know, yeah. being a little too judgmental. But the more you listen to that inner voice, and it sounds different than your own voice. It's from a higher perspective always. It seems, but I can see the guides and the guides that kind of came in today as I'm talking. I've got Archangel Michael always. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Um, he's usually with me when I'm doing sessions and mm -hmm. he's giving me advice about uh, what this person may need. So there's Michael, there's Saint Germain. There are these beings known as ascended masters. There are people that have been through a lot of lives on this earth and they've essentially mastered it you know they've they've finished that cycle mm -hmm. but they come back to help and guide others so a lot of people do have guides that are ascended masters too which is great and they're beings like the buddha mary magdalene saint germain um he's very funny <laughs> um it's uh what do you mean Oh, funny. 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 Oh, yeah. he's like, just his personality is very funny. <laughs> <laughs> he's like a jokester, kind of. And he started coming to me a couple of years ago, and I was like, who is this? <laughs> and I was very lucky to have someone in my life to explain some of these mm. things going on. He's like another spiritual teacher. And when I was going crazy and thinking I was going crazy, he's like, no, you're not. <laughs> this mm. is who this being is. So yeah, St. Germain is, is here. And then there's Archangel Michael, there's Raphael, and there's also um, 
Oh, that's interesting. Um, there's also Krishna. I don't really talk to him that much, but yeah. <laughs> so wow. yeah, yeah. So how? Wh- I'm curious what your process was getting to know these guys. Did you uh-huh. have to, like you're saying, ask for guidance from other teachers to sort of understand, or did they teach you themselves who they were and why they were here? In the beginning. Um, I kept having dreams where these guides would come to me and, mm. and tell me that, you know, this is who I am, this is what I'm doing here. But I didn't believe it. Mm. <laughs> My first dream with Archangel Michael, who who looked like a like a god or like a statue and he had this huge sword. And I woke up the next morning, I was like, Archangels don't exist. That's crazy, <laughs> you know? Actually I didn't even say that. I didn't even know he was an archangel. I I had a teacher at the time, and he was someone who was just in my life to help me emotionally as I was going through some some personal things. Um, and I was telling him about these dreams, and he and he was the one that told me about archangels. Wow. Yeah, that was what it was. He told me about archangels, and he told me about these ascended masters. And they would keep appearing in my dreams and tell me that this is my name, this is what I do. And I was kind of like, no, mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm making mm-hmm. it up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but the teacher that I had definitely helped show me that this this is actually real and then I did for a while try to seek other readers other intuitive other intuitive teachers to see what their thoughts about this was but I didn't see a teacher for a very long time because the dream started to take over and the dreams mm-hmm. were saying okay this is what we want you to focus on instead and you need to know who these guides are and we want you to do research on this and that kind of thing so I just started to go off on my own path and then over a certain period of time, start to learn how to read people too. Wow. When you're reading people, is that you, Ty? Or is that you as a vessel for your guides? When I'm reading people, it's a little bit of both. In the beginning, when I started reading, it is me saying what I see, looking at someone's aura, Mm -hmm. and then talking about the colors and what that means. It's different for everyone, although people may have similar colors. Mm -hmm. But reading someone is never the same. It's always different. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And it's really um, being in tune with someone's energy. So it it is me saying what I'm seeing. And then after that, I launch into the channeling where I ask the guides to come in, and then they just start talking to me about what this person needs to know. Wow. I'm really struck by the benevolence of the whole collaboration. And I wonder if you have a sense, I mean, you mentioned earlier these times that we're in right now specifically being really intense. And I think a lot of people feel like we're on the shift of some kind of pretty seismic change or Mm -hmm. evolution. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like there's a a battle being played out between good and evil or what is your sense of what's happening? Yeah, I definitely feel like there is a battle, but one of the guys just said, he's like, well, there's always a battle going on. Mm. (laughs) Um, There is always some sort of tension or like, you know, always um, a huge amount of tension between good and evil. And that's kind of what we're here to learn. But this time in particular, it feels like it's coming out of left field and like things are calm. But the guides have shown me that this time we're learning that there always has been this undercurrent of, of evil. Maybe it's been hidden for a very, for a while, not too mm-hmm. long, for a while, but it's coming out now. Mm-hmm. So this time feels a little bit more volatile than it has in the past. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's kind of, it needs to happen. And there will always be this fight and tension between good and evil. And maybe it's not even to call something good or evil. It's just the light and the dark. Mm-hmm. And that's what has always been battling But it's important because this in-between space that we're in, you know, that in-between space between light and dark is where the most interesting things happen. And when we learn a lot more about ourselves than if things were just stay good. But, you know, it is a time where people are showing their true colors. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, everyone's going through a bit of a personal journey with that Mm. and learning where they lean, if they lean towards the dark or towards the light. Not that anything is, is good or bad, but, um, it is teaching a lot about people this time in particular. So what's your understanding of the role of the darkness? That's a, that's a hard one because that's also something that my dreams have been trying to teach me about mm-hmm. recently as well. I think that the darkness resides in all of us. We all have it. We all have a part of ourselves that we're not, that we don't like. We don't want to show that to other people. 
but it exists because we're human. Mm -hmm. And part of our um, journey is to learn to accept that part of ourselves. If we want to change it, do the things necessary to change it. But the darkness is there to teach us, always. We learn through suffering. It's not how I would, <laughs> how I would make it. <laughs> but unfortunately, we learn the most when we suffer and when we go through pain and such like hard, dark, and painful experiences. So the dark, it really is there to teach us and to make us stronger. It can do that, or it can go the other way, where it can make us even more bitter, or more resentful, mm-hmm. and, and hateful. Mm-hmm. So it has a purpose. It really does. But it's up to a person and an individual to choose what is this darkness going to teach me and what is it going to turn me into, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And that's, mm-hmm. that's, the interesting, that's the interesting part. And I suppose that's where you could go to the guides to ask for help making it a lesson instead of a yes. curdling of yes. resentment. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Because there's always a lesson behind it. So earlier you were saying that we all have a mission or a purpose that comes, you know, with us choosing this, this life, this incarnation, but we also have free will of how to live it out, I suppose. Exactly. I almost feel like to me, sometimes the guides show it to me as like, there are tons and tons of contingency plans. Like if you don't do (laughs) your, your mission and your path, or you do this instead, that's totally fine, but you're going to, you're going to fulfill some sort of role anyway. They were not required at all to do what we came here to do. Um, mm-hmm. We can do anything. And anything that you do is, is accurate and correct. No matter what, though, you will always do what you're supposed to be doing. So it's odd. <laughs> like, there is a goal here, and there is, like, a preferred, like, well, if you did this, you would really learn your lessons, and maybe you wouldn't have to come back here as often. <laughs> but you can do whatever you want <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> so it's really, it's kind of funny. We really do have free will, always. And the guides are not, like, they don't punish, you know, they don't, like, I get that question a lot sometimes. They're not disappointed in you if you make the wrong choice or anything they're just there to help you no matter what no matter what choice you make what decision you make they're they're there to help you you know they'll also tell you maybe in your dreams if you keep having recurring nightmares or that kind of thing they'll tell you that maybe this choice you make or the, this decision that you made didn't help you mm-hmm. um, but we really do have free will to go any anywhere that we want and no matter where you go you will always end up doing what you're supposed to do Wow. That's weird. wow. <laughs> That's yeah. <a> weird <laughs> it's so reassuring though that like nothing is fundamentally wrong. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. At least from my perspective. Do you have a sense of your mission, your purpose? Um I think that I've I'm doing it. I think. <laughs> Although things can change um at any time. I'm really passionate about teaching other people how to step into this. So hopefully my purpose is connected to and I'll, I'll accomplish it somehow, but mm-hmm. <laughs> it's connected to maybe building a school if possible or some sort of organization in the future where intuition is studied and also it's taught and it's a very normal thing because lots of people come in with these gifts and abilities. Some of them get lost in them or don't quite understand what's happening and it can be overwhelming, mm-hmm. but it's, I hope that I can in this lifetime, you know, bring some clarity on this issue and put it out into the world in a way that it's not like a taboo subject Mm -hmm. or it's not weird, Mm -hmm. you know? (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I do, I do have an interest in darkness and how that manifests itself psychologically, antisocial personality disorders Mm -hmm. and what, what's that about and what that means spiritually, what these beings are doing here. Um, that's another interest of mine as well. Mm. So yeah, so it's stuff. You're you're making me think mental illness a little bit. Is that, I've been thinking about that a lot because some of my experiences with plant medicine have changed the way that I see quote unquote crazy people and just being like, I think their portals are open in ways that maybe they're not fully able to control the way the rest of us have all these filters that help us navigate 3D life. Yeah. And it seems like that's not necessarily a bad thing as long as those people would be protected and like given the space to be that right. in society. Right, or even the tools. Because I think that there's <laughs> like some research done into shamans that take those those people um, that seem like they're struggling to be in this reality that take those people under their under their wing and kind of teach them how to use their gifts for a different purpose or how to see things differently and um, teaches them that it's okay that they're thinking that the way that they're thinking you know 
Yeah. I, when I was in New York several months ago, there was a guy on the subway platform and he was yelling at someone that I couldn't see, but he was talking about how whoever he he was angry at needed to lay off the angel Gabriel, basically. And everything that he was saying to me made sense. If I could see the person that he was yelling at, I was like, this is a coherent argument, you know? Mm-hmm. But I mean, I, I was fearful for him just because the environment was chaotic and he seemed alone in this fight that he was having. But yeah, I just had this very clear moment of recognition of like, yeah, I mean, yes, yeah, you're right. Yeah, he's saying something that's accurate. Yeah. Maybe it's coming out in a way that's not like, you know, our world doesn't right. approve of. But yeah, that he is seeing something and connecting into something that is, that's accurate. Yeah. I have the sense that there were times in human history, and maybe it's been thousands of years, where this was valued and maybe even was a central communication system. Do you feel connected to any particular lineage? I'm Haitian. So there is the kind of voodoo Haitian tradition. My parents grew up Catholic and my family's Catholic, so I didn't have that connection to it. But I'm noticing, and I really have an interest in all world religions, Mm -hmm. there are these connections between these religions, although they're all very different in their own way. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that I really follow any lineage. I am... I find lots of interesting things like in the Tibetan uh, tradition where they do a lot of dream work and study lucid dreams and they even have a whole book, you know, on that on that topic and about the afterlife. And then I'm interested in the Egyptians and the way that they viewed dreams and the intuitive beings and the afterlife and that kind of thing. And what have you learned Americans. from them? The Egyptians are very interesting. They saw the value of dreams within their time. They even had sleep temples. They would have priests and priestesses help people journey in the dream world. They would call those temples like healing temples. Mm. And they have written so many interesting things about these gods and goddesses that, I mean, I I can see and interact with when I astral project or when I lucid dream, um, but we still, we don't really think anything of them in this time. But there's something to them, you know, like Anubis and... Osiris and Isis, those beings are still relevant today. The other day I was listening to a podcast called Lore, and the narrator of the podcast was talking about Egyptians, and he talked about how they looked at dreaming in a very different way than we do. And they wouldn't say things like we say now, like I had a dream the other day, or I dreamt about this. Instead, they would say, I witnessed a dream. Mm. So they view dreams as this thing that happens when we fall asleep and we just happen into this other world that is always there, fully present, and we get to experience just a little bit of it. And then we wake up from that. Hmm. So yeah, there's just so there are beings that are things. always in dream world. Yeah, uh, yeah, and so like if you astral project or anything like that, at any time you'll find yourself interacting with these beings. But you know the astral projection thing is really interesting because you want to make sure that you're in a good state of mind before hmm. you do that. Lucid dreaming's fine, but <laughs> astral projection, if you're kind of having a bad day and then you want to try it out, you tend to attract what your thoughts are giving out. So you wake up outside of your body and you're still in that like bad mood or whatever. So you find yourself in this environment that reflects that. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing with Mm -hmm. the dreaming and that other world. It's not something that you can control easily. It's very fluid and it does take practice and discipline. But there are some traditions that have that have it down you know that have these rules i know the tibetans have rules with lucid dreaming and astral projection on how you can get yourself to the point where you're able to be there and be solid and Mm. you know gain a lot of um, interesting perspectives Mm. hindus have studied this for a very long time and they already wrote about what happens when you dream, what these gods and goddesses are doing, what their lessons are. They, they write a lot about these gods and goddesses still learning lessons too, and you read these stories where they're learning these moral, moral lessons, and they try to put it in, in their ways that I'm finding um, correlates with what I'm learning in my dreams. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Mm-hmm. So recording dreams is, is an important way to yes learn about our own lives. Oh my gosh, yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> I've been recording my dreams for a very long time, and I try to do this practice where once a week I look through my dreams that, that I had that past week and see how 
it uh, matches with what's happened in my life and if there were any like messages or warnings or things that I should listen to and they're always accurate. And it's crazy because the more you pay attention to your dreams, the more that you um, get from them and the more that your guides will give you information and you'll have these transcendent experiences. So I'm, I'm doing my best to try to go through all of these different religions and trying to see what resonates with me and, and what is sticking. Oh, is your understanding of gods and goddesses that these would be spirits that have never taken human form? Like, do they exist completely in a separate realm or do they come in and out as we do too? They come in and out. Uh-huh. Um, they come in and out. They can be guides and they influence other people, you know, and they're there to teach people lessons. But very rarely they do come, they do come in, you know, and they also learn as well from my experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's not very often that I meet someone that comes in and it's also a huge thing for me to say, like, <laughs> well, so I don't usually say it, but it's just something mm-hmm. that um, helps inform me about the person. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there are some gods and goddesses that do come in still learning their lessons. Would it be fair to extrapolate from that then that perhaps all of us have some of that in us if we're... Yes. Okay. Yes. And so usually I find that um, any god in, or goddess that you've always been interested in or these beings that keep popping up in your life, if it's you keep seeing elephants, maybe Ganesh, you know, mm-hmm. the guides will give you clues throughout <laughs> your life that'll tell you like if you're on the right path or maybe this is your connection or these are the beings that you're interested in or that maybe you you come from maybe that's where your higher self comes from you'll always get clues and you'll always know when someone says a name if you feel something about it the guides are saying that's usually it's indicative that you are very connected to that being what are you talking about when you say higher self to me the higher self is kind of like a part of us that can oversee everything and knows everything. And it's the one that is setting our journey for us to help us learn more about ourselves. But it's not just one portion of us. It's not just us in this lifetime. Our higher self is all of us in all of our lifetimes. And it's our influences, it's everything. It's our oversoul is another word I hear used for it. It's very possible to connect to your higher self in your dreams even just setting that intention before you go to sleep. Some people like to just talk when they're lucid in their dreams, just talk to the sky or just say something, ask a question, and you'll get a response. Usually it's the higher self responding. It's that part of us that we all have access to that that knows what's coming or what's happened in the past and can help us put the pieces together. Mm -hmm. I just love the invitation that you're making to step into that because it makes life so much more... Magical. Magical. <laughs> yeah. 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 And we don't... Yeah, it's really hard when you're kind of like, you know, day to day, waking up, going to yeah. the office, you know, sitting on your computer, going home, watching TV. It's really hard to kind of think that there are these other influences out there. But that's why it's even more important to make mm-hmm. the effort to step into it. See if it changes your life. See if something different happens. Mm-hmm. You have nothing to lose. hmm we have imaginations for a reason. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, definitely. I do think our imagination, too, is like a hodgepodge of like maybe past life memories, mm-hmm. stuff that we're going through now, uh, imaginations and things from the afterlife, memories and that kind of that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. That's been like a struggle for me trying to find balance between my spiritual life and my very much human life. But I've been learning that there is so much value here and what's going on right now with our culture and all around the world. And that it's not separate from what we're learning spiritually or what these ancients knew. It is, it's just as important. Mm. And that's the reason why there's like this res- resurgence of this type of information. There is a want in all of us to understand our place in our world around us, but we can't separate, we really shouldn't separate spirituality from our human life. It's, it's part of it. Hmm. Um, it's just as important. And finding that within your human life is even more rewarding than just staying in that spiritual bubble mm. all the time. Mm. So integrating it back in is yeah. just as important. Exactly. 
mm-hmm. and finding it, you know, finding the little moments in your life that you're like, whoa, I, that's a lesson that I was reading about in, in this book, or mm-hmm. um, I just experienced something that was really beautiful, you know, finding those moments of transcendence here is so much more important than just, you know, wanting to lucid dream all day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You also made me think earlier, um, I was talking to some shamans in Peru who were saying that they have like entire families on the other side sometimes, like relationships in the spirit world. And I remember when I first heard that, just, you know, kind of taking it as a fairy tale almost, like cool story. But (laughs) I feel like the more and more that I've opened my heart to this and even just talking to you now, I feel like I just got a whole new level of understanding how that would be possible. And that there are certain people that really can walk back and forth between between, worlds. Yeah, but it definitely, it does take practice. It takes balance. And because I've, I've been through both. Like when I finally did start to believe in what I was seeing and experiencing, I just wanted to stay in the spiritual world all the time. And I had to, I had to learn the hard way because that's how the universe teaches you. (laughs) But you can't stay in that space all the time. You can't stay in that bubble. You can't pretend as if there's not all this strife and struggle going on outside of you. So I had to, I had to learn that that's not how you how you live your life but i think what can help keep you tethered here and even more involved in your human life is knowing that you have a mission and a job to do Hmm. and that is as fun as it is to stay and and talk to your guides and just stay in that intuitive space you have a job to do here and you're here for a reason and you know your guides will they'll start reminding you like okay great we're so happy you're learning about this past life okay can you can you come back really <laughs> they like kick you out yeah if <laughs> if you are using it for those sort of reasons mm-hmm. so when you're saying you had to learn that the hard way it was like life like grabbed you yeah. and pulled you back in oh yeah. yeah yeah i found that there was a lot of turmoil in my personal life because i was neglecting it mm. and i was wanting to study so much and and lucid dream and pretend that there's you know everything's love and light and da 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 so i had to go through that mm-hmm. to learn to find my my balance mm-hmm. and what that is and what that means to me and also falling in love with with being human there's so many things to fall in love with here <laughs> You know that like moment when you go through something really hard, but you come out of it? Just that, that moment where you realize I am, this is over, hmm. and I learn something from it. That feeling of like I've overcome a challenge, I've made it through, that's what I really love mm. about being human. Like it's that feeling of like I have, I've overcome this, and now I'm stronger. It's the small things for me, you know? Um, If it's like really rainy one day or looking at a flower or looking at the way people treat each other in a very kind, loving way. And the small things that happen every day, you know, (laughs) when someone's just being kind or someone just like smiles at someone for no reason, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's those sort of things. We think that there's no meaning behind it. It's just happening. It's just random. But I think that there is a lot of meaning behind it. There's just this wealth of beauty and knowledge that we all have. And when it comes out, even in small ways, that's what I really love. I love witnessing that. And I love being that when I can, mm-hmm. you know? Do you believe in randomness? Is, that, is there such a thing? I don't think so, personally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So when you notice synchronicities, that's sort of an invitation to like imbue your life with meaning. Yeah. Synchronicities happen like all the time. If you pay attention, you notice. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing here is so special. As humans. Yeah. What are the animals doing here? A lot of animals I notice act as guides to humans. You know, they're here taking care of the earth in their own way. Some animals, though, teach us lessons. If there's an animal that keeps popping up and appearing, like the crow or the raven, Mm -hmm. maybe a bear, you keep seeing it everywhere, it's a lesson for you. And there's something that you can learn from this animal. The animals are there to teach us. They're, they take care of the earth, but they're also there to, to teach us about ourselves, especially if we have pets. Um, I have a pet, Cyrus. <laughs> and he appears in my dreams a lot, and he teaches me things. <laughs> Is that a puppy? No, he's a cat. He's a funny cat. <laughs> Is Cyrus an sassy. Egyptian god? I really wanted to name him something cute and normal for a cat. But <laughs> I had a dream before I went to go pick him up from the pet shelter. And he appeared and he told me his name was Cyrus in the dream. And I was like, I don't, I don't like that name. (laughs) 
<laughs> but then he just showed me, he showed me the word Osiris and then he crossed out the O and just said Cyrus. And he's like, that's my name. Wow. And then when I went to the shelter and I called out that name Cyrus, he he listened and he perked up and he came over to me and the, the person who was going to give the cat away was like, oh, he knows his name. I was like, yeah, yes. <laughs> They're here to be companions, but more so I find them being teachers. Like, you know, a human being may have a lot of issues and try to project their issues onto this animal. The animal doesn't take in any of those issues. They will kind of mirror Mm -hmm. what's going on. Cyrus does that a lot. And what I notice when I give readings for pets, so that's what happens. Mm -hmm. Pets can kind of show what's going on with you and your life and how you're handling it. (laughs) So they're there to, to teach us. Do you think there are animal souls and human souls, or do we take turn? Like, could we come back next time in an animal body? There are some people out there that don't believe that we can go back to an animal soul, that there is a bit of a hierarchy there, mm. that we come in and maybe we start off as like a rock or a plant or grass. And then mm. after that, we go into the soul of an animal. And then after that, when we're ready, we go into the soul of like a fairy or, you know, mm. something like that or some um, in-between elemental being. And then we, we incarnate as humans. And then after that, you know, who knows, maybe angels or archangels or whatever. But a lot of people believe that there's a bit of a hierarchy there. And I, I'm inclined to, I think that that's, I think that, that might be a thing too. Mm. With animals, they can be guides, like spirit guides coming in for just a second to kind of teach you something, and then they'll come out. And I notice one thing that's interesting is that animals don't have color in their aura. Um, Human beings are the only ones that do. So animals don't really have any color, at least that's the way I see it. It's clear, but sometimes if there is a little bit of a guide or someone that's in that animal, I'll notice just a little sliver of color and then it will disappear. So what do you see with animals can you still see energy yes i still see the aura it looks it's just very clear hmm. um i still see energy and maybe it is this sort of um animal oversoul or whatever that's coming in or spirit coming in but that's what i see with animals and then with humans i see just a, a ton of color um if the answer to this is no that's totally fine but is there anything that you feel like is coming through that you want to share from the guides that are here right now? Sure, yeah, they're gonna make me. (laughs) Right now, particularly this time period, when I say that I mean the summer, this is a very hard time for a lot of people. Most of us are going through some huge internal conflict, even external conflict, and we're seeing our world reflect what we're going through right now. If it helps at all, This is what the guides are saying. But if it helps at all, remember your courage. Remember how strong you are and remember that you're going through all of this for a reason. Then you're not gonna fail. You're gonna make it through and everything will pass. But this is a hard time. And you can allow yourself to acknowledge that, but also acknowledge that you will move forward. I bet it helps. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. But yeah, I I enjoy training people to help them to learn more about this part of themselves. Um, even training other readers and helping you get to that stage, if that's anything anyone's interested in. Where can people um, find you? Tyfanellis.com is my website. And you can also find me on Instagram, Tyfanellis, or Facebook. Amazing. So yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. So you. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> I'm so glad you all joined us again today. Thanks for hanging out. I have to say, I've been thinking a lot about Joan of Arc as I've been thinking about Ty. I know that's a very well-known story. I certainly grew up with it, and I think it fits into a matrix of Christian saints that is pretty easy for us to hold in this culture. But I, I think after talking to Ty, I heard it with new ears and was just thinking about the courage of a young woman who was visited by beings that gave her a very clear message and the radical devotion that she showed to her own 
self, to our own intuition, to follow the messages that came through. At the time that she was growing up, France was involved in a hundred years war and everything that she would have known would have been a pretty vulnerable, upended time, a lot of violence. The English were practicing scorched earth tactics at the time where they would just burn villages as they passed through and her own village, a farming community, had been com completely destroyed in that process when she was a young girl and rebuilt over years. So the message that came through was really to, to save her people. And that's been so resonant to me as I've thought about the time that we're in now with the Amazon burning and so much feeling so tenuous. It's clear to many of us that the burning of the Amazon is the burning of our village. And it's really hard to know what to do with that. And I'm certainly feeling a lot of grief. And I think that so much of the wisdom that we need to stop the destruction of our planet and of ourselves is going to be intuitive wisdom that comes from, sure, the guides, the spirit plane, the plants, the animals, the animate world that we in the West so much have been taught is inanimate and looking to that for wisdom, looking inside ourselves to the voices that are not sanctioned by any other authority to a completely new form of consciousness. And that takes courage, especially in the face of authorities and governments that will take their controlling prerogatives to the length of, you know, metaphorically and literally burning teenage women alive. And I was really struck by reading about Joan of Arc today to see that um, there are modern scholars who have put forth this theory that the reason she was seeing visions was because she had contracted a form of bovine tuberculosis that had essentially made her crazy. And just feeling so sad for the guy that had put forth this theory that he had such a, a barren internal landscape that he needed to rationalize and explain away her experiences. In that way. I want to share an excerpt from a book I started reading this week. It was recommended me to me by a friend. Thank you, Andrew. It's called The Spell of the Sensuous by David Abram, and it's about magic, essentially, and a form of consciousness where we shift our thinking and feeling about our place in the world as humans and it it involves embracing magic which i think is kind of a catch-all word that i find myself often using to describe things like what tai is experiencing so i want to read this passage from early in the book where he's talking about a new way of seeing the world that he started learning in bali from the shamans there at, which is very much about reanimating everything around us and seeing the spiritual world as not something outside of this realm, but actually deeply imbued in everything around us within this one. This felt very nourishing for the part of me that's been mourning and has given me a lot of faith that human imagination contains all the answers all the tools that we need to live in balance with one another and with source and deepens my faith that people like Ty are on the right track and have wisdom that we have to honor, we have to look to when the models that we've been using have been failing us so deeply. So highly recommend you check out this book, The Spell of the Sensuous, and here's a little taste to take you out into the world and to remember that magic is all around you, it is inside of you, the more you investigate and honor it, the more you will find yourself in very, very powerful company. Anthropology's inability to discern the shaman's allegiance to non-human nature has led to a curious circumstance in the developed world today, where many people in search of spiritual understanding are enrolling in workshops concerned with shamanic methods of personal discovery and revelation.
Psychotherapists and some physicians have begun to specialize in shamanic healing techniques. Quote, shamanism has thus come to connote an alternative form of therapy. The emphasis among those new practitioners of popular shamanism is on personal insight and curing. These are noble aims, to be sure, yet they are secondary to and derivative from the primary role of the indigenous shaman, a role that cannot be fulfilled without long and sustained exposure to wild nature, to its patterns and vicissitudes. Mimicking the indigenous shaman's curative methods without his intimate knowledge of the wider natural community cannot, if I am correct, do anything more than trade certain symptoms for others or shift the locus of disease from place to place within the human community. For the source of stress lies in the relation between the human community and the natural landscape. Western industrial society, of course, with its massive scale and hugely centralized economy, can hardly be seen in relation to any particular landscape or ecosystem. The more than human ecology with which it is directly engaged is the biosphere itself. Sadly, our culture's relation to the earthly biosphere can in no way be considered a reciprocal or balanced one. With thousands of acres of non-generating, non-regenerating forest disappearing every hour, and hundreds of our fellow species becoming extinct each month as a result of our civilization's excesses, we can hardly be surprised by the amount of epidemic illness in our culture, from increasingly severe immune dysfunctions and cancers, to widespread psychological distress, depression, and ever more frequent suicides, to the accelerating number of household killings and mass murders committed for no apparent reason by otherwise coherent individuals. From an animistic perspective, the clearest source of all this distress, both physical and psychological, lies in the aforementioned violence needlessly perpetuated by our civilization on the ecology of the planet. Only by alleviating the latter will we be able to heal the former. While this may sound at first like the simple statement of faith, It makes eminent and obvious sense as soon as we acknowledge our thorough dependence upon the countless other organisms with whom we have evolved. Caught up in a mass abstraction, our attention hypnotized by a host of human-made technologies that only reflect us back to ourselves, it is all too easy for us to forget our carnal inheritance in a more-than-human matrix of sensation and sensibilities. Our bodies have formed themselves in delicate reciprocity with the manifold textures, sounds, and shapes of an animate earth. Our eyes have evolved in subtle interaction with other eyes, as our ears are attuned by the very structure to the howling of wolves and the honking of geese. To shut ourselves off from these other voices, to continue by our lifestyles to condemn these other sensibilities to the oblivion of extinction, is to rob our own senses of their integrity and to rob our minds of their coherence. We are human only in contact and conviviality with what is not human. Reach out. Ask the spirits, the animals, the elements, the plants to talk to you, to teach you. We are so not alone. You are so not alone. I love you. Be well out there.